for some weeks we've been on a series we're calling The Blame Game. The Blame Game. And our uh, main text is here in Genesis 3 when Adam and Eve um, disobeyed God and ate of the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil. The scripture said uh, that right after they did that, they went and hid. They tried to hide um, from God. Now that is a, a, a futile endeavor, <laughs> trying to hide from God. You just can't do it. Um, he saw you when you picked your hiding place. So that's just not going to work. But um, the Bible said in Genesis 3, uh, 7, they, they sewed the fig leaves together, made themselves aprons. They uh, heard the voice or the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife, both of them, hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. So the first effort was just to hide completely from God. This reveals that they had sinned. And because prior to that, they had no fear of God. They, they didn't run from God. They communed with God. But this is one of the terrible consequences of sin is fear. Fear of punishment. Fear of judgment. And so they are, even though they know God is there, they heard his sound and uh, they prior to this been communing with him, they're trying to hide themselves. This is the tendency of the fallen nature to hide and to cover. But notice what happened when this didn't work. Verse 9, the Lord God called to Adam and he said, where are you? He said, I heard your voice in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. He said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree whereof I commanded you that you should not eat? So if we just back up to verse 11, what is the answer to this question? Have you eaten of the tree? Uh, he didn't ask him anything about his wife or about the serpent or about any of that. Uh, he, have you? Have you eaten of the tree? whereof I commanded you that you should not eat. Now, you've got some these and thous in the King James, but really you appears here three times. Have you eaten of the tree that I commanded you that you shouldn't eat? So who's he talking to? Adam, have you? What's the answer to this question? Yes, I did. But that wasn't his response. If you can't just keep it covered and hid and you don't want to deal with the truth, what else can you do? You can try to blame somebody else. And that's what happened. Verse 12, he said, the woman, that's not answering the question, that you, that's still not answering the question, gave me to be with me. She gave me of the tree and I did eat. At, at the end, he does say, yeah, I did. But he, he puts the woman that you gave me. Um, we're going to see this, I believe, further as we go tonight. Uh, even though a person uh, acknowledges something, that doesn't mean they repented. That's a significant thing to understand. Though a person acknowledges something, that doesn't mean they repented. Though a person cries and feels bad, that doesn't necessarily mean they repented. Now, if that sounds strange to, strange to you, don't let that get away. This is very important. Um, one of the things to answer, if somebody's really upset if they're crying because they've missed it and messed up, what are they upset about? <laughs> what are they upset? Are they upset that they got caught? 
That's not repenting. Are they upset that they're not getting what they want? That's not repenting. Can you see what I'm talking about? Just because there was an acknowledgement, that doesn't necessarily mean there was repentance. Now let's keep reading verse uh, uh, 13. The Lord God said to the woman, what is this that you've done? And the woman, again, leads with trying to blame. The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. So an acknowledgement, but not necessarily of repentance. Now, uh, we saw in, in previous studies on this, and if you haven't heard the previous lessons, I, I encourage you to get them. They're, they're available there on the website. won't cost you anything. But we saw in Proverbs 28, 13, Proverbs 28, 13 said, He that covers his sins shall not prosper. But whoso confesses and forsakes them shall have mercy. The big problem with blaming is that you're not repenting. And if you're blaming somebody else, you're judging them and you're not judging yourself. And if you don't judge yourself, you will be judged. You won't get mercy. Man, when we've missed it, what we need is mercy and grace. But if you're blaming somebody else, if you're refusing to admit your culpability, yeah, maybe I shouldn't use that word, responsibility, then uh, you are being proud. And the proud don't get the help. They don't get the grace. Only the humble do. And one of the, the, the key characteristics of humility is honesty. You show me a humble man or woman, I'll show you an honest man or woman. They're inseparable. And uh, uh, another translation of this, let me read that. The BBE, the basic English says, He who keeps his sins secret will not do well. But one who's open about them and gives them up We'll get mercy. Well, we want mercy, especially when you've messed up. You don't want judgment. You want mercy. But if you won't even acknowledge that you've missed it, how are you going to get forgiveness? How are you going to receive cleansing? How are you going to receive righteousness restored over something you won't even admit that happened? Can you see the problem? Uh, sometimes people have said, well, you know, I, uh, Christians don't really need to repent. That, all that means is changing your mind. Well, it means more than that. And I'm going to get into that in just a few moments. But uh, people have reasoned and said, well, Jesus has already paid for all my sins, even the ones in the future. He's already paid for them all. So why do I need to repent? Uh, well, even though he has done it, that doesn't mean you've received it. Are you listening, child of God? If it's all done just because he did it, then everyone will be saved. Even those worshiping other gods, even those who blaspheme his name, everybody will be saved if it's just based on what he did because he bore the sins of the whole world. It's done. But according to Jesus himself, everybody's not going to be saved. In fact, percentage-wise, it's few compared to the billions on the planet. Why? Because many refuse to humble themselves and admit that they've been sinners, admit that they're lost, that they need a Savior, Receive Jesus, receive the forgiveness, receive the cleansing. You got to receive it. And if you don't receive it, you won't benefit from it. Even after we've been born again, we didn't lose our will. And if you violate light, your heart will condemn you and bother you. First John talks about this. And even though I blow it big, that doesn't mean Jesus has to go back to the cross or he has to do something else to pay for that. He has already paid for it. But I violated light. And the result of that is that my own heart 
will condemn me. Not the Holy Spirit, not God the Father. My own heart will bother me. My conscience will bother me. And if I just try to pretend like it didn't happen, that's not going to fix it. It's not going to fix it. What fixes it? Thank God, 1 John 1, 9. You acknowledge it. You humble yourself. And you receive, oh, thank God, you receive of the cleansing of the blood of the Lamb. It never loses its power. Hallelujah. It never stops flowing life. You receive forgiveness. You receive cleansing. You receive the righteousness. Hallelujah. And when you do, your heart will stop bothering you. Your conscience will be clean and clear again. Thank God the blood never loses its power. But you do have to receive it to benefit from it. Uh, notice with me, go with me please, to 2 Corinthians, the seventh chapter, and let's talk some more about what real repentance is. 2 Corinthians 7. Now let me remind you that uh, it's a mistake to uh, be popping popcorn <laughs> or going back and forth and doing loads of clothes, washing, drying. Somebody said, you don't, well, you don't understand, Brother Keith, what a multitasker I am. Yeah, and you don't know how much you're missing. How do you know what you missed? Because you missed it. You don't even know what you missed. And that's the problem. Uh, don't let the enemy rob you now. Give, give this your full attention and your full focus because everybody's spirit needs to be fed and your faith needs to be built up by the anointed Word of God. And that's what you and I, all of us together, are believing for in these times. And we're, we're believing that the Spirit of God is everywhere at once and He can minister to you there like He can minister to you if you were in the room. But... If you don't pay attention uh, like you would when you were in the room, then you're coming short on your part. So don't, don't let that happen. Uh, 2 Corinthians, the seventh chapter and the sixth verse, 7, 6. It says, uh, God that comforts those that are cast down. Oh, he is the comforter. He does it by his spirit. Those that are cast down, he comforted us excuse me, by the coming of Titus. Keep going. Not by his coming only, but by the consolation wherewith he was comforted in you. You know, God, you, God comforts us, comforts us through each other. He does things, you, you, he answers prayers uh, through each other. He said, when he told us your earnest desire, your mourning, your fervent mind toward me, so that I rejoice the more. Now, to understand this, you've got to know about 1 Corinthians. And they had a situation, more than one situation in the church that just wasn't right. And Paul, the Spirit of God through Paul, corrected them uh, strongly. And uh, he, he reproved them uh, strongly. And in verse uh, uh, 8, he said, Though I made you sorry with the letter, he's talking about 1 Corinthians, I do not repent, though I did repent. For I perceive that the same epistle has made you sorry, though it were but for a season. Now he's talking about repentance. And the church, by and large, repented at the admonition and correction that the Spirit of God gave them through him. And I want you to see that it involved more than them just casually changing the way they thought. I've heard sometimes people say, well, all repentance is, is changing your mind. I disagree. Scripture shows other things. It does involve thinking differently, but it involves the heart. And it involves a turning 
turning from something and turning to God. Uh, if you're repenting, that means you missed it somewhere. You got away from God somewhere. You got away from what's right somewhere. Well, you don't just need to keep going the wrong way. You need to turn around from going the wrong way and get back to God. You need to turn away from what's wrong and go with what's right. And uh, the only way you're going to do that is if you care. You care what God knows and what he says about what's right and wrong. And if you care, then when you see that you've ignored him, you've been hard-headed, you've been stubborn, you've been rebellious, you've hurt other people. I'm talking about Christians now. When you see that, it's not just that you go, oh, yeah, I see that now. Let me make a little adjustment in my thinking. No, you care if you messed with people's lives, if you caused problems. Now, you're not supposed to receive condemnation and dwell in it, but you sh if, if you care about what God knows, if you care about pleasing him, it's going to affect you. It's going to touch you. And that's what he says. He said that letter made you sorry, but it was just for a season. You didn't go off into some uh, bout of depression for months. Verse 9, I rejoice, not that you were made sorry, but that you sorrowed to repentance. For you were made sorry after a godly manner. Uh, see, in talking about repentance, he's talking about a heart that is sorry for missing it and making mistakes. Not just a casual change of the thinking, but a heart that is sorry. You were made sorry after a godly manner that you might receive damage by us in nothing. Verse 10, for godly sorrow. Now here, this is, this is so important. He distinguishes between two kinds of sorrow. Godly sorrow works repentance to salvation, not to be repented of. But the sorrow of the world works death. There is a, another word you could use for this is grief. There is a sorrow and there is a grief that is not of God, that's got nothing to do with God. There's just death in it. And you can grieve and you can hurt and you can be ashamed and you can receive condemnation and it's, it doesn't please God. It's not his will. It's not proving anything to God. It's wrong. It's death, the sorrow of the world. But there's another kind of sorrow, a godly sorrow. Everybody say godly sorrow. Godly sorrow. What is that? It's when you see you've missed it and you've displeased uh, God. You've, you've uh, gone the wrong way. You've uh, uh, not done his will. You ignored him. You hurt somebody else. I'm talking about Christians now. And when you see that, you should care that you didn't obey God. You should care that you caused somebody else a problem. Now that doesn't mean that you grieve like those who have no hope, that you beat yourself over the head, that you receive condemnation. No, that's that, that's that worldly sorrow that works death. But what is this? You're moved. You care. You draw to God. You acknowledge it. You confess it. And you don't just acknowledge it. You want to change it. You're willing to make a change. You turn from it. You turn to God. You know he loves you. You know he's already paid for it. You receive forgiveness, you receive cleansing, you receive the washing and regenerating of the Holy Spirit, you receive the complete righteousness of God in Christ, and there's no reason for you to hang your head tomorrow. No reason for you to be condemned and have any ungodly worldly sorrow. But at the moment when you realize it, there is some godly sorrow. Ungodly sorrow, godly sorrow. Sorrow 
of the world. Can you see this, friends? He said, uh, this uh, godly sorrow works repentance to salvation, not to be repented of. Somebody say, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Uh, turn with me, please, in the scriptures to some things that Jesus said about repentance. Matthew 11 and about verse 20, Matthew 11 and 20. Um, I'm, I'm moving a little bit too quick. Go to Mark 1, 14 first. I heard somebody on an um, uh, interview show, one that's aired internationally. This is several years ago. And it was a well-known minister on the uh, show with some other people being interviewed. And the man that was doing some interviewing on this particular one, I don't know that he's a believer. Maybe he is. I don't know his heart. But he was not being very respectful of the things of God. And he was, uh, he was kind of trying to push this one pastor saying, you know, well, uh, G talking about uh, embracing all types of lifestyles and all types of beliefs and, and, and being completely inclusive as, as it, they were talking about. He said, well, you know, Jesus preached um, love and acceptance. Jesus preached love and acceptance. And he's telling the, um, the pastor that. You know, one thing we need to watch is about letting unbelievers tell us what Jesus preached. Yeah. Our unbelievers tell us, you know, uh, who Jesus is and what he is. And uh, pretty much the whole, you know, panel, uh, whoever else was there, they, oh, yeah, that's right, that's right, Jesus preached love and acceptance. And when they said that, the Lord spoke up inside me. I don't mean I heard an audible voice, but inside me, he said, no, I didn't. You know, he's inside us 24-7 in the person of his spirit. He said, no, I didn't. That's not what I preached. Wow. I mean, now that, that surprised me because I thought, now, hold on. If somebody would just ask me that on the street, Jesus preached love and acceptance. He said, no, go, go look at the scripture. See what I actually preached. Man, you got to watch about traditions and ideas and all this kind of stuff. So I did. I went to place after place to see exactly what Jesus, what the Bible said Jesus preached. And this is one of the best examples of it right here that I know of. Mark 1, 14. After John was put in prison, Jesus came to Galilee. This is the beginning of his ministry. Preaching what? The gospel or the good news of the kingdom and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent you and believe the gospel. What did Jesus preach? He preached the kingdom of God and repentance. Now repentance is not the same thing as acceptance. <laughs> is everybody awake? It's not even close to being the same thing. Jesus didn't preach that you accept everything. He commanded his people his disciples to love each other as he loved them. That's the commandment. But we're talking about what Jesus preached. What did he actually preach? He preached the kingdom of God and he preached repentance. Repentance. And uh, you'll notice he said a number of things about this. With that in mind, look at that scripture um, in Matthew 11. Now there's other places that show this, not just one. I just wanted you to see that. But Matthew 11, in verse 20, then Jesus began to upbraid the cities wherein most of his mighty works were done because what? Because they, they wouldn't repent. They repented not. And he said, woe to you, Chorazin, Chorazin, woe to you, Bethsaida, for if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Zidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. Now, you know he's right. You know he's speaking by the Spirit of God. He said, uh, the, these, you know, Tyre and Zidon were judged and destroyed. Uh, 
He, he said, if these things had been done there, they'd have repented. Verse 22, I say to you, it'll be more tolerable for Tyre and Zidon at the day of judgment than for you. And you, Capernaum, which are exalted to heaven, you'll be brought down to hell. For if the mighty works which had been done in you had been done in Sodom, it would have remained to this day. <laughs> there would still be a city called Sodom, Jesus said, if they had heard my preaching and seen the miracles in my ministry in Sodom and Gomorrah. They would have repented, but you won't. This is amazing, isn't it? I say to you, it'll be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for you. Uh, the worst thing that can happen to any human being, I know this is a big statement, but I'm making it. The absolute worst thing that could ever happen to a human being is refusing to repent. That's it. Because anything else, God can fix. Everything else, I don't care if it's emotional, mental, physical, financial, marital, family. It doesn't make any difference what it is. God could fix it. He's already made provision for it. But if you won't repent, he's not going to force you to believe on him and humble yourself and receive his grace. He won't force you to do that. So you're in a place where you don't get his help. And I think you would agree, is that not the worst place you could possibly be? The worst thing that could possibly happen? Because he can, he can do anything. He can fix anything else. In Matthew, you're Matthew 11. Go to Matthew 21. Matthew 21, 28. Jesus gave this, uh, this parable or this simile. He said, what do you think about this? He said, a certain man had two sons. He came to the first and said, son, go work today in my vineyard. And the son said, I will not. I ain't going. <laughs> well, that's, that's disrespectful. I ain't going. But afterward, he repented. He did what? He did what? He repented. And went. So repentance didn't just mean he made an adjustment in his thinking. Can you see this? He had a change of heart and he had a change of action. He turned from the direction he was going and he went to the other direction. He wasn't doing it, but he had a change of heart and mind and he did it. He repented. Verse 30 He came to the second, his second son. And he said the same thing to him. You know, he said, uh, go, um, work today in my vineyard. And he said, I go, sir. So uh, respectful and the right answer. But he what? He didn't go. He went not. He said the right thing, even used respectful uh, term and title. The, the father said, son, you, you go and work in my vineyard today. He said, uh, yes, sir. I'll go. Here we go. But uh, the morning drug on and he didn't go. And at lunchtime, he, he wasn't there. And he, he was busy, I guess, maybe playing video games that afternoon. Or, or then he, uh, he, he decided he needed to go shop for something. I don't know what happened. But the... Uh, the result was that he never went. You got talk and you got action. And we, we, we need to remind ourselves continually that it doesn't matter how much you say you love God and, you know, oh, the Lord's everything and this and that. He said, if you love me, Jesus said, you'll do what I say. John 14 talks about this. You'll keep my commandments if you love me. Verse uh, 31, he said, which of the two did the will of his father? Well, that's not a trick question. Which one did it? The one that talked good or the one that actually did it? 
And you got to remember how the first son started off. He didn't start off good. Disrespectful. He's talking disobedient. But what happened? He repented. He ch- it's not just what you do. It's what you do last. It's not how you start. It's how you finish. It's not just saying and doing something dumb and making mistakes. It's what kind of heart do you have? Can you see that the first son, even though he was disrespectful and he was acting stubborn and rebellious, yet apparently after that encounter, not too long into the day, he had had something about his heart that bothered him. He got to thinking, I shouldn't have said that. I I shouldn't have told. Can you see what repentance is? It's not just a casual change of mind. It is a change in your thinking. It's also a heart change. It's also a direction change. He said, uh, the publicans and the harlots go into the kingdom of God before you do. Now, you talk about a slap in the face (laughs) to self-righteous Pharisees and doctors of the law to tell them that the publicans and the prostitutes are beating them into the kingdom of God. Oh, man, You, you, you know, This is what led up to them crucifying him. Verse 32, for John came to you in the way of righteousness. You didn't believe him, but the publicans and the harlots, the prostitutes, they believed him. And you, when you had seen it, oh man, this is revealing. They saw something. They did know the scriptures. They, They are seeing fulfillment of prophecy. They know it, but they won't admit it. And he said, when you had seen it, so they saw it, but they would not repent. When you had seen it, you repented not afterward that you might believe in him. That, my brother, sister, is the worst thing that a human being can do. That's the worst thing that can happen to you is to refuse to repent. I'm making the choice, how about you, that I will repent. Hallelujah. We, we, don't, we don't want to be quick to receive any condemnation. There's no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. We do want to be quick to repent. When we see that we've missed it, you've got to be on the watch because the enemy, he'll try to bring stuff to, to you know, condemnation. He's always trying to do that. And so, he's the accuser of the brethren that accuses us before our God day and night. And so, accusations come on a regular basis to your mind, uh, in life, and you need to uh, not just accept every accusation that comes against you. If somebody says, well, you know, Keith, you missed it on that. I'm not just going to go, oh, no, did I, did I, did I, did I? I'm not going to do that. I have to see it. Come on, do you see what I'm talking about? Just because you say I missed it, that doesn't mean I did. Just because some other circumstance, I, I want to be willing to acknowledge it, but I must not be quick to receive condemnation. I must not be quick to receive guilt and shame. I've been redeemed. Well, somebody say, I've been redeemed. But I do need to, if and when I do see that I violated light, I shouldn't have done that, or I should have done this. I did miss it. I should be quick to repent. Not not quick to receive condemnation, but quick to repent. Again, what is repentance? I'm, I'm quick to acknowledge the truth. Remember, we, we talked about that last week. When you do that, You recover yourself out of the snare and trap of the enemy, Timothy said. I'm quick to admit, yeah, I did miss that. I I violated light. I care. I'm not going to receive guilt and shame and condemnation, but I care. And I'm willing to change. Change the way I think. Change the way, what, what I'm doing. Change the direction I'm going. Not quick to receive condemnation, but quick to repent. Not try to hide it like Adam did. Not try to cover it up. Not try to blame somebody else. 
If I missed it, I missed it. I need to acknowledge it. I need to repent. Hallelujah. Go with me, please. You believe we're making any progress here? I do. Uh, go with me over to Exodus, please. The 32nd chapter. Thanks be to God. No, I'm moving too quick again. <laughs> Some of these things I've never taught just like this. Maybe a piece or a part here and there. So you, you said you prayed earlier, right? And you, you're believing with me? Go to Hebrews 6. Let's do, let's do it like this. Hebrews, the sixth chapter. And man, this, this really is a big thing here that we're about to touch on. I... Um, I was wondering if we were ready to actually get into this, but you know, I think we are. I think we are. So uh, actually, this begins in Hebrews 5 toward the end of the chapter. So go there in Hebrews 5 and uh, end of the chapter. He said, uh, verse 14, he said, strong meat belongs to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern between good and evil. Let me remind you of our text and where this study started. It concerned the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And the, th this wasn't written in chapter and verse, so the next verse is chapter 6. And verse 1, therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection. Now, he's not talking about flawlessness. He's talking about full development, growing up and developing fully in Christ. And he mentions six things that the Holy Spirit calls the um, principles or we could say the foundational principles of the doctrine or the teaching of the Christ. Now, obviously, this is really important. Six things, and notice what the first one is. Repentance <laughs> from dead works. And the second one is faith toward God. And this is what Jesus preached. Do you remember that? We, we, we said he, he went talking about the kingdom of God and he said, repent and believe the gospel. Repent means acknowledge the truth, be willing to change in your heart and mind, turn from the wrong things. And here it talks about dead things and faith towards God. Repentance and faith. These are, the, are number one and number two of the six foundational principles of the doctrine of Christ. So it's not okay for anyone to make light of repentance in the new covenant and to trivialize it and act like it's no big deal. Maybe just changing your mind a little bit. No, it's much more than that. It involves that, but it's much more than that. He goes on to say, um, the doctrine of baptisms, that's a principal doctrine. The laying on of hands, that's a principal doctrine. Resurrection of the dead, we certainly know that's a principal doctrine. And of eternal judgment, principal foundational doctrine of Christ. And this will we do if God permit. Now, focus with me for the next few verses here. For, 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 he's not changing subjects, for it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift 
and were made partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come. We need to pick up that phrase again in verse 6. It is impossible if they fall away to renew them again unto repentance. Seeing they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. This is what some call uh, the unpardonable sin, which is a wrong term. Some refer to it as the sin unto death. You'll see that, that phrase in uh, 1 John, John's writings, the sin unto death. That is a scriptural phrase. But there are untold number of people with terrible mental problems and those that are confined in mental institutions who believe they've committed the unpardonable sin and that there is no salvation for them. They went too far. They were too bad. They've committed the unpardonable sin. I, I don't really like that term in talking about this passage that we're reading here. And you got people on both sides of this. Some people believe once saved, always saved. That if you're really born again, then you could not possibly be lost after that. But that's acting like that you, ha you don't have a will. You do have a will. And read carefully the book of Jude, just one chapter there. And read the epistle of, epistles of 1st and 2nd Peter. And if you read it carefully, I don't know how you could uh, continue to believe that once saved, you could not possibly be lost. He goes into multiple examples of why that's not true. But at the same time, people get out of that ditch, go all the way across the road, get in the ditch on the other side of the road, and they believe that there are all kind of sins that if you do it, I, I shouldn't say all kinds of sins. There are certain sins that if you do it, God won't forgive you. And the, the reasoning is if I commit this terrible sin and different groups categorize them with certain titles and labels and names. If I commit this kind of sin, I'm lost no matter what I do. And I've even, I've talked to people before that believe they have done this and their, th their thinking is, well, there's no need for me to go to church. There's no need me, uh, for me to pray. Uh, and I might, I, mean, I might as well do anything I can do because I'm lost anyway. Lies. Lies from the enemy. I want us to go over this again and see what it actually said. Not what people have imagined. It said, uh, talking about these six foundational principles of the doctrine of Christ, what was the first one? Help me out. What was the first one? Repentance. Repentance. And the second one's what? Faith. <laughs> Faith. You, you got things that are important, and then you got things that are the foundation of the whole thing. And that's what these six are. They're the foundation of the whole thing. Repentance is what he's talking about. And it said, then he went on to say in verse 4, for it is impossible. And then he, he's very specific about who this could even happen to. And he, he lists item after item. It's impossible for those who were once enlightened. Now that means you saw your need of salvation. You, you were under conviction. You saw your lost condition. You saw your need of Jesus and have tasted of the heavenly gift. That means you were born again. Jesus is the heavenly gift. And salvation, you know, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. We've been talking about that on Sunday. So number two, you're born again. You tasted the heavenly gift and 
were made partakers of the Holy Spirit. That's filled with the Spirit, speaking with other tongues. Keep going, verse 5. And have tasted the good word of God. Now, you've got to remember, just a few verses earlier, he was talking about strong meat for those who were of full age. This is talking about somebody that's not just on milk, but have tasted and fed on the good word of God and, and the powers of the world to come. That's the gifts of the Spirit. That's, that's manifestations of the powers of the world to come. Things like the gifts of the Spirit and other. I won't claim to know all about that. But uh, this is not a baby Christian. <laughs> Can you see this? There's not somebody that got saved last week. The rest of it that he talks about couldn't even apply to them. Yeah, you were enlightened. Yeah, you got saved. Yeah, you got filled with the Spirit. Yeah, you've been feeding on the good Word of God and growing and developing. You have experience in the gifts and manifestations of the Holy Spirit and the powers of the world to come. This is a developing, uh, maturing child of God. Verse 6, if they fall away. Now, you've you got to go back and pick up that, that phrase he started with, verse 4. It's impossible, verse 6, if they fall away to renew them again to repentance, seeing they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh, put him to an open shame. Um, it didn't say God wouldn't forgive them. Which is why I don't, I don't like that phrase, the unpardonable sin, talking about this. It didn't say God wouldn't forgive them. What did it say? You cannot get them to repent. That's the problem. That's why I said earlier, that is the absolute worst possible thing that could ever happen to a human being is that you get to a place where you won't repent. Because if you'll repent, His grace is sufficient. Hallelujah. If you'll repent, the Lord, how many remember when the Lord on the cross, He said, it is finished. How many think He took care of everything? Were there any sins He didn't take care of? No, no matter how terrible, how awful of a thing you may have done, Jesus took our place. He paid the price for it, but it won't benefit you if you won't repent and believe and receive. That's why, sadly, even though Jesus has paid the price for the sins of the whole world, the whole world will not be saved ultimately. I know it's sad, but it's truth. You got things that people want to believe and like to believe, and then you got what's actually true. But thank God, if you're willing, if you're willing, you can be forgiven. No matter how far you got away, no matter how, how bad you messed up or how many thousands of times you messed up, if, or somebody say if, 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 if you will repent, he'll forgive. You can receive cleansing. You can receive washing. It can be like you never messed up. Even, even if you went as far away from God as you could possibly go, even if you lived in the gutter and dregs of sin and you backslid for 40 years and were the most terrible person around, if, oh, somebody say if, if, yeah. if you will repent, heaven is yours. Forgiveness is yours. Restoration is yours. Cleansing is yours. Full unfettered, unlimited fellowship with the Holy Father is yours. I, I had a man one time look at me and he said, yeah, but preacher, you don't know what I've done. I said, yeah, and you don't know how powerful the blood is. People underestimate the blood. Oh, the blood of the Lamb is so powerful. It didn't say God was done with them. Didn't say 
he wrote them off. What did it say? You couldn't get them to repent. Couldn't get them to repent. That's why we say that's the worst possible thing that could happen to a human being. Proverbs 29 talks about this. Proverbs 29 and verse 1. If you'd look at that, please. Proverbs 29, 1. He that being often reproved hardens his neck shall suddenly be destroyed. And that without a remedy, with no solution, with no cure. Not because God couldn't fix it, but because of a repeated hardening, often reproved. Do you see that? Reproved numerous times, but just hardening the neck and resisting. You can't keep that up indefinitely because all at once there will be destruction and no fix and no cure, not because God couldn't fix it, but because of a refusal. The devil is the proudest most rebellious, most stubborn being we know anything about. And sadly, he's been able to breathe that uh, rebellion and stubbornness into most of the human race. All of us have been affected by it, but thank God a bunch of us have received Jesus and been born again and had our nature changed. But you do not want to be like the devil hard-hearted and stubborn and just refuse to admit when you know you messed up. It's the dumbest thing. All of us have made mistakes, but friend, let's change this one thing. Lest we keep God out of our life. He said, I stand at the door and knock, but he's not just going to blow the door down. We have to invite him in. We have to humble ourselves and say, Lord, I need your help. I want your help. I want your grace. And that requires humility and an acknowledging of the truth. I want us just to stand up wherever you are right now. Just stand up. I want us to act on this for a few moments. Nothing's too hard for the Lord. There is nothing he cannot fix. There's nothing he can't heal. There's nothing he can't restore. But if we hide and cover and won't confess and won't acknowledge and won't repent, you're stuck and it will not get any better. Oh, friend, God can change things so quickly, so radically. It can go from terrible to wonderful in just a very, very short amount of time. If, if, if. We will repent. Let's practice. Let's act on it right now. Let's humble ourselves. Just stand up. Focus on Him. If it's convenient for you, kneel uh, in, your, in your room there. Kneel by the, the TV or the screen or whatever it is. Let me lead you in a prayer and then let's pray in the Spirit some. Said out loud, Father God, I reverence you. You are right. All of your judgments are faithful and righteous and true. At any point, that I've disagreed with you. If I, if I said I'd go, but I didn't go. If I said I'd do, but I didn't do. That's not okay. I care about pleasing you. I care about doing your will, fulfilling your plan for me, being the help to others that you intend I should be. I humble myself before your great presence, before your Holy Spirit. Enlighten me. Anything 
I need to see. Reveal it to me or remind me. Hallelujah. I don't receive condemnation. You told me not to. But when I see a violated light, I will be quick to repent, quick to change, quick to believe, quick to obey. Help me to pray in the Spirit about anything I need to see or do, repent, change. I'm willing by faith in Jesus' name.